Freedom of speech applied in the social media contest remains a contentious issue around the globe and the African continent is not immune. Many governments blame social media for the spread of disinformation and for contributing to violence around the world and they make efforts to curb its use. To give you an idea, about 40 new laws relating to social media have been adopted worldwide in just the past two years, and another 30 are under consideration. Virtually every country that has adopted laws relating to online content has jeopardized human rights in doing so. In Nigeria, the government on June 4 announced the indefinite suspension of the use of the microblogging site Twitter, one that is very popular among the Nigerian youths and has played major roles in pushing conversations around social issues, from the Bring Back Our Girls campaign to the recent NSARS protests. After a massive outcry, the country's House of Representatives summoned the Minister of Information, Lai Mohammed. I want to make two clarifications. The first is that we did not ban Twitter. We simply suspended indefinitely the activities of Twitter. The second thing is that we did not suspend the activities of Twitter because they deleted Mr. President's tweet. Not at all. We are very unambiguous on why we suspended Twitter. Twitter became a platform of choice for those that want to bring down this country. If any other platform does it, it would suspend their, their operations too. Because it is because there's a country called Nigeria that they can, be, they can have business. On the general use of social media in the country, Mr. Mohammed had this to say. Social media is a menace everywhere in the world and they, they are faster than the world. Because every day new Africans are coming, we, we just have to struggle to catch up with them. And we believe that the best way to start is by regulating them, is by ensuring that they register with us as Nigerian companies first, and then they take license, and there will be do's and don'ts. And if you do, if you do what you are not supposed to do, we find you. Checks by News Central confirms that despite the ban and the government's threats to arrest and prosecute anyone violating it, many Nigerians are continuing to tweet. I am using Twitter despite the ban. And the reason why I am using Twitter despite the ban is because the ban is an illegality. The place is still quite vibrant. We still have Nigerians using Twitter. Uh, so like, and it's 5%. And it's five percent of Nigerians still use Twitter. Whether they ban Twitter or they no ban Twitter, we will still tweet. We will still make the noise on social media. It doesn't stop anything. But is this really a good thing? Is this affecting efforts to reinstate its use in Nigeria? If um, Nigerians didn't have any other option, like now we're using VPN to access Twitter, but if there was no VPN, if we could not actually access Twitter, I'm very sure that the pressure will be more on the government to find a solution to but now that there is a back door, people are not, <laughs> the pressure is not so much on the government. I, I feel they are intentional about what they are doing because stopping Twitter is just for Lai Mohammed to come to TV and say, as from today on, we want to put an end to the Twitter ban. They thought that the moment they just put a ban on Twitter, that's it. Every one of us, we're going to shut up. Every one of us, we're not going to be able to say anything again. Well, shame on them. That's not actually uh, what happened. And so if the if the ease is, is the reason why they have they are still being disobedient to the law, knowing fully well that a, cost, a, a regional court has actually said what they've done is wrong and they are holding on to it, then I think it's a government that really should be ashamed of itself. Indeed. Twitter's suspension in Nigeria has cut off millions of Twitter users. The ban, while celebrated by some, has cast a global outcry over freedom of expression, including from some in the diaspora. One of them spoke to us. The Nigerian government has to be willing to make some compromise for the sake of democracy and for the sake of those who elected them and also give the voice back to the 40 million people to continue to be a check mate on the government, to give feedback to the government on how well they're doing and how they can improve. But is that where the problem lies? 
Are governments worried about the power of the youth to effect change through social media? It is a fact that since the Arab Spring, many young people in different countries in Africa have demonstrated against dictatorships, the extension of presidential term limits, the lack of transparency during elections, police brutality and other unpopular socio-economic policies. Here is what data tells us. According to a 2019 Mo Ibrahim Forum report, almost 60% of Africa's population was estimated to be under the age of 25 years, making Africa the world's youngest continent. The United Nations, in its own demographic projections, states that the median age in Africa in 2020 is 19.8 years. Now, almost 16 million young Africans, around 13.4% of the total labor force of 15 to 24-year-olds, are unemployed. More than 40% of young Africans consider their current living situation to be very bad or fairly bad. And 60% of Africans, especially youth, think that their governments are doing a very bad or fairly bad job at addressing the needs of the young people. Therein, according to experts, lies this push to participate in demonstrations as they try to change systems that are perceived to be incompetent and responsible for the daily suffering of people. Here is an excerpt from the comments of the Director of Thematic Engagements at the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Peggy Hicks, at the recent press conference on the issue of governments banning social media in relation to people's inherent rights. Governments respond to public pressure by rushing in with simple solutions for complex problems, and also because some governments see this legislation as a way to limit speech they dislike and even to silence civil society or other critics. I want to emphasize that we have the same rights online as offline. But when we look at the online landscape and you see a digital world that is unwelcoming and frequently unsafe for people trying to exercise their rights, you also see a host of government and company responses that risk making the situation worse. Recent developments in countries, including, for example, among many others, India, Nigeria, the UK, the US, and Vietnam, have spotlighted these issues. Hicks' words seems to echo a prevailing sentiment among interested parties in the Nigerian Twitter ban and recent efforts to exact controls on the media. Foremost human rights activist Aisha Yusufu does not believe the government really has an option when it comes to releasing Twitter suspension. The solution to the ban is simple. The federal government should unban it. There are no other things. What are we going to start doing that? What? Oh, we tell them that we will not criticize government. We will tell them that we will not hold them accountable. We will tell them that when they do wrong, we're no, no, that's not it. It's just one simple solution. And it lies in the hands of, of, of the government. So the government should uh, unban Twitter. That's the solution to it. But, as you well know, the Nigerian government has stated clearly conditions that must be met for a possible reinstatement. The, the, the suspension is indefinite, it's not banned, and we say the doors are not closed. We are willing to speak to Twitter. Twitter has written a letter seeking for government dialogue. But like we said, there are two basic things that Twitter or any OTT or social media needs to do. They must first be registered as a Nigerian company, after which they will apply for a license. Other conditions will come up as we go along. Will registration help the government achieve her purpose? At what continued cost will the suspension be for the many young people who use it? While we consider these, what in clear terms must be the responsibilities and liabilities of social media sites in ensuring humane online environments? What is the relationship between good purposeful governance and the seeming fear of the power of social media? 
These are questions we must find answers to if we are to make any progress towards a society where the government need not fear social tools that, if used wisely, could help them measure the quality of governance they provide to the people if good governance is truly their goal. Felicity is a weekend for News Central Television.